Well, it's 6 a.m. in the morning. I've just woken up in Sejuna and I'm about to start my trek up the Googs or the Googs track, however you want to pronounce it. It's about a two day trek uh, crossing something like 300 sand dunes. It's considered a mini Simpson Desert. So I'll uh, get all this Land Rover packed up, get my breakfast, and uh, see if I can uh, get through without any issues. It's uh, the beginning of real adventure, I guess. Turning off the air highway onto Calanby Road, my excitement builds. Never before have I crossed a dune field. I'm not sure what to expect. But I do know that I have only myself to depend on to get out of any trouble I find. Or which finds me. Well, my trip on the Googs track is just about to begin. I've uh, passed through one of the gates. I've uh, just noticed that the, the track is starting to get a bit more sandy and it's changing from the harder stuff back for, uh, further on. So I've decided to stop up here. I'm gonna lower down my tire pressures, probably to start around 20 PSI, just so I'm not tearing up the track. So I've got some uh, Storm Tire deflators. I've tried them a few times, I haven't quite set them up correctly just yet, but they're good to uh, do a quick deflate, and then I use my gauge to check the pressures properly. Here's what I consider to be the beginning of the Googs track. From here on in, it's four-wheel drive only. And this here is the dog fence. It's designed to keep uh, wild dogs, such as dingoes, out of the sheep and cattle property beyond the fence. And here's a pretty important section here. Warning! This is a remote area and people traveling this track will need to be totally self-sufficient with food, water and fuel for the duration of their trip. Drinking water is not available in the park. Four wheel drive vehicles only. Approach sand ridges with extreme caution as Googs track has two way traffic. Numerous sand ridges cross the track up to 25 meters high. As a safety measure, it is recommended you tune your UHF radio to channel 18 and fit a sand flag. And I'll make sure people can see me now when I'm crusting up over the hills. It stays up above the vehicle, so just as you come up on the crest, your flag's up here. Anyone coming up over can see the flag before your uh, bonnet comes over. It's a good little safety measure. And just to reinforce the uh, warning here, the Australian Outback doesn't treat fools too lightly. Basically, people have died out here. It uh, can be a long way for help and if it takes you two or three days to drive somewhere you can be sure that it takes two or three days for the rescue workers to get to where you are. There's not much place nearby for a, a plane to land and helicopters probably don't have the fuel capacity to get as far out where you are, pick you up and get back to the nearest town. So you're basically on your own for however many days it takes for someone to come find you. So my car at the moment I've fully um, filled up all my fluids in Sejuna. I've got about 70 litres of water, 185 litres of fuel, and enough food for easily for two to three weeks. So I'm pretty well set. If I break down, I'm, I'm laughing. I can just jump on the HF radio, call out for some help, and uh, wait however many days it takes to get parts or supplies or whatever I need. So just remember that when you're travelling out in the outback. This is where I am now, on the dog fence. I was just in Sejuna before, when I left this morning. Headed up Calanby Road. It's fairly easy going, gravel road, and then it starts turning into sand country up this way. So I'll be traveling all the way up, spending a night out here, I think, at Googs Lake. Up here is an Exeter site, Mount Fink. I can do a walk over here. And eventually it ends all up here on the Trans Australian Railway. You certainly don't need to carry as much fuel, water, and food 
as I am for this short track. After the Gooks, I'm exploring the Udnadatta and Lake Eyre, so I'm carrying additional supplies, so I have the option of camping an extra week or two if I find a particularly awesome spot. I was just driving along and it's only been six minutes on the track and I come across this tree uh, blocking half the, half the track width. It just goes to show the laziness of a lot of people out here. They uh, drive up on the outside edge, extending the width of the track, uh, causing erosion issues, damaging the vegetation. And it might only be a, a simple five minute job to get this moved off. So I'll see if I can drag it off first. If not, then I'll get my toolkit out. How easy was that? I lost a couple of buttons on the bottom though, my shirt. That's okay, I'll probably undo it later on when it gets hotter, when I reach uh, out of springs. So now you've got the track, you can just keep on heading. Ahead of me lie over 360 sand dunes to traverse, spread out over the 154 kilometre length of Gulk's track. In 1955, construction of the track began stopping not far from Mount Fink. A local man, John Gook Denton, started pushing a track northwards from his farm boundary in 1973 to join with the original section. Three years later, it was complete. Thus far, it's all pretty easy going, with the sand fairly firm. just stopped on top of this sand dune. It seems every large sand dune out here has an incredible view on the other side. I keep stopping and taking photos and getting more video. It's uh, quite a rugged, beautiful, vast landscape. Very dry, there's uh, seen maybe a glimmer of water off in the distance at one point, like a small puddle, but otherwise, not a place you want to break down without enough supplies to get you through. So it's still only been about three or four hours now I've been driving since I left Sejuna and already I've run into my first mechanical issue. The corrugations are pretty bad out here so it gives everything a pretty good shakedown. Before I left Sejuna I did a pretty thorough check over the whole vehicle, crawled underneath, I found three issues which I had repaired so I ended up staying, staying an extra week in Sejuna to get those done. But I've found, uh, I was just at the crest of that top, at the crest of that last hill I was looking around doing some videos, just drove down here and I started smelling a, a burning smell and then a fairly loud rattling sound. So I pulled up quick, lifted up the bonnet and tracked down my issue to the muffler. It's disconnected from the turbo outlet. Uh, I had some gearbox work done uh, about a month or so ago by Land Rover Mechanics and it looks like they haven't torqued up all the bolts because I also found a couple of nuts for my gearbox were finger tight where the uh, rubber mounts fit to the chassis which was uh, pretty poor I think. So I've uh, lost both the bolts for this uh, bracket which holds the muffler on. Uh, so I'll go through my spare parts kit, see what I can find and then jack up the muffler back to reconnect it and tighten everything up again. You can see here where the uh, muffler has disconnected and that burning smell I was smelling was all the exhaust coming in to the cabin. So there's a mount down a bit further and that's where the bracket is and I've got two holes there to, to fill in with some sort of bolt or wire, whatever I can find.
Now I carry a pretty decent spare parts kit. So I'll grab that out and uh, see what I can find inside. Hopefully I'll have a couple of bolts the right size, otherwise I'll have to make something up. Now it's important when you're out traveling on these rough roads that you have everything strapped down as well. So my two boxes here, number one is my recovery gear, number two is all my spare parts. Keep them strapped in tight, so in the event of a rollover or whatever, uh, I don't have anything bouncing around inside the cabin which will kill me. These Wolfpack boxes are really good too. They're sturdy and you can strap them in nice and tight. So in here, various hoses and bits and pieces. I should have some spare nuts and bolts. Oh, there they are. Bag of loose odds and ends. So I've had a look through and unfortunately I don't have anything quite the right size. I've got one that might be small enough but there's uh, captive nuts on the bracket which uh, joins to the chassis so probably not going to have much chance of getting one the right size and the right thread. So it's plan B. This here is fencing wire. It's pretty strong stuff and you should probably never go bush without some. You can use it to uh, tie up anything that's broken, just get some fencing pliers, twist it together, and you'll you'll keep oh well, you'll get your home basically. So I'll give this a go. And I better raid my toolbox as well. And you can see everything's pretty easily accessible. Don't have to pull out too many boxes. And canvas bags too are really great because the, uh, they don't tend to rattle around as much compared to a metal tin. These big beauties here are fencing pliers. Nice and strong. Comes with cutters. You got three cutters on this one. Just like that. One, two, three. So I can use these to twist the wire together. Probably do me. It appears to be on tight, so so uh, there we go. It's not the most beautiful job, but uh, that will help me keep on going. I'll check back on it later on, see how we go. It's already just after one o'clock. Uh, stopped so many times through filming and plus my repairs. It's uh, getting a bit late, so I'm gonna have some lunch. I pulled off the track and uh, yeah, trying to relax a little bit. Peanut butter sandwich would be a nice, quick, simple meal. The sand has become softer so I've lowered my tyres down further to 18 psi. I'm not encountering any problems cresting the dunes. Check out this view. This is all Mali country. It's a species of multi-stemmed eucalyptus. A lot of the early pastoralists who came out and colonised this land, they had to uh, clear all the multi-stemmed tubers out by hand and it's a very time consuming process. The first point of interest out here that breaks up the monotony of the dunes is not far ahead of me. A pair of memorials to John Denton and his son Dinger who built the track. Travellers offer tokens of thanks to the pair in the way of beers, coins or other artefacts.
Well, I've arrived safely at Googs Lake. That's for my uh, first night for my campsite. Didn't really have too many other issues. The uh, repair job I did for the muffler, I had to do that again a short time later. Just added a couple of extra bits of fencing wire and that uh, has got me this far. So I have to get it properly repaired once I reach Cooperpedia, I'd say. But otherwise, the, uh, I've had a look around. It's, uh, I'm the only person out here that I've seen today. And there are quite a few flies, so they seem quite friendly. So tomorrow I'll stay here at Googs Lake and do a bit more exploring. Explore the, the lake edge, do some photography, and see if I can find any wildlife. I did see a, a few birds and a thorny devil, which is a little lizard, earlier on today. But there's not too much around. So day one complete. The sun awakens, marking my second day on the track. The reds and yellows fade, while the white of the salt begins to gleam. This is Googs Lake. It's a saltwater lake. Basically, uh, it's pretty dry out here, so it's not too much waterfall, and the lake stays dry most of the year. All the water that does come in here is fairly salty, and it evaporates and leaves all this white crust you see. Some of it's actually sand, but the rest is actually salt. So if I could bring up a little bit here, everything's salt crystals. It's fairly nice tasting salt too. It is prohibited to drive on the lake's surface. The lake's edges can be soft and a vehicle can become hopelessly bogged. I spend some time exploring the many tracks around the lake's edge. My car's dash is having a few issues on these corrugations. I've uh, lost a few screws and some of the mounting parts have, have broken just due to old age. The, uh, where the hole fits in, it's all cracked so there's not much material there to uh, bite into. And I don't have any washers the correct size so I've looked around and I found an old bottle cap. So I'm going to turn this into a nice washer, drill a hole through the centre and that should uh, keep my dash together for the rest of the track. So I'll just bash in around the uh, edge there we go a quick uh, washer in the bush I'll put that on and hopefully that will keep the dash together you can see here there's just nothing really holding it together it's just been bouncing around all the area around it has cracked off uh, so I need a nice washer like this bottle cap to spread the load and uh, hopefully keep it all together. There we go, tight as, that ain't going nowhere. Night time offers relief from the flies. The best time to knock up a simple meal, steak and veggies. Well, it's the morning of the third day now. I've spent yesterday here just relaxing, reading, uh, a bit of sleeping as well. So before I head off now, I'm gonna do a quick check under my vehicle, check for any more loose bolts, nuts, anything that's broken or wearing out, just to make sure that I keep on uh, getting through the track without any more issues. So I always use a tarp, keeps me, keeps me clean. Of course, be mindful while checking your vehicle of any reptilian friends who may have curled up against a warm engine during the night. 
So from Googs Lake I have another 74 kilometers or so before I make it to Mount Fink. So let's see how I go. From here on I have a lot more and bigger dunes to tackle. I have a drive in me now in my 30s to seek adventure, to explore, to create memories. Is it lonely travelling solo? Yes, sometimes. But what scares me more than being alone is waiting. Waiting till retirement to begin living my life. That life of adventure and exploration I dreamed of in my early 20s, but was too afraid. Too afraid to do it alone. So I waited, hoping to meet someone to share the journeys with. But they never came, and my 20s faded. Now I roam, living my some days today. Just check out this view. I'm about uh, another 40 kilometers to go before I get to Mount Fink. But uh, you can see here the uh, sand dunes. When I first read the sign out to you at the beginning of the track it said there was 360 of them and you can see them clearly here. One after the other after the other. There's definitely a lot of up and down driving out here. I can actually hear, you know, birds still chirping away. It's getting close to midday. It's just impressive how anything lives out here. It's just so little water, just so dry. I've just noticed a bit of change in the vegetation type. It's just uh, a bit more sparser now. The mallee isn't as thick and we're getting more of these wildflowers which are quite nice. We've got yellows and whites all around the place which gives a, a bit of colour. Ran out of oomph. Lunch is a welcome break from the noise and the strain from constant concentration while driving. I must always stay alert for oncoming traffic while cresting dunes. I've just crested a sand dune and I uh, looked out and I could see what appears to be Mount Fink. So it's not much longer to go, I'd say about 10 to 15 kilometers. Certainly uh, stands out starkly against the rest of the, uh, the landscape. Really have to watch out for some of these uh, low-lying branches along the track. Thankfully this uh, sand flag is in two pieces so when it does 
get caught, the top one just comes out and stops it being snapped, which is useful. Mount Fink, the next highlight along the track. The Mount Fink camping area provides rest to the weary traveller, with plenty of room to set up camp, even a table or two for your convenience. Mount Fink is 369 metres tall. I find a track that I'm guessing leads to its base. It's rough, so I'm taking it slower. More time to enjoy the landscape. Looks like the end of the line. Well, the landscape's changed quite dramatically. The uh, millions of years of erosion of Mount Fink has turned the surrounding area into mostly rock. So it's fairly slow, rough going to get up to the track which goes to the base of the mountain. There's also a lot more wildlife around. I've noticed heaps of birds, which tells me there's bound to be water somewhere up in these mountains. Little pockets and stuff of rain has provided water source for all the local wildlife. I'm going to uh, get my hiking pack and take a walk up, have a look around down the lower end and Maybe tomorrow I might even try tackling a walk up to the up to the top. This depends how hot it's going to get. Beautiful country though. Let's see what I can find. I feel a little worried exploring this gully solo. I keep having visions of twisting an ankle on the loose surface and having to crawl my way back down in the dark. The vegetation up here is a darker green, a good sign of water. Well, I was right. I kept on walking up, a fair way up, and I found the first water I've seen in about the last three days. It's not very appetizing looking. Uh, I guess in a survival situation, if that's what you've got, you can always filter it through a sock with some sand and charcoal. It might uh, make it a bit more appetizing. That explains why there's so much wildlife around. All these rocks uh, collect any dew and uh, any rainfall that might come out this way and store it for quite some time. How's that? Spinifex and Mali. About as far as the eye can see. Oh, it's quite impressive. I reckon if I went up to the top of this hill, I could probably see the curvature of the earth. The distance is just so vast. I don't know where the nearest human being is. I know uh, there are a few campers back at Googs Lake, along with me. So that might be a... Uh, <laughs> quite a few hours drive to the next person but it's just beautiful the, the silence out here it's oh a few birds but uh birds and and flies <laughs> tonight a nice selection of fresh vegetables and a good slab of steak so 
this is my third night now on the Googs track. So I found a nice little secluded spot on uh, near Mount Fink, just away from the main campgrounds. But yeah, I'm pretty happy with my progress thus far. I think tomorrow will be a day of bushwalking and then I might head out and cross over the railroad track and that's it. Well, it's early morning. I've just watched another beautiful sunrise. The reds and oranges are just incredible along the skyline. It just fades from all the reds, yellows into the blues. There's still a few stars out of you when it, when it comes up, which is really wonderful. So I'm going to attempt to climb Mount Fink today. I'll start on that edge and I might get up as far as that middle point. Well, I've changed my mind. I think I might tackle the big one from here. It looks like I can weave my way up around the edge and up that edge there. It doesn't look too steep, but uh, if, it, if it is too much, I can always come back down and tackle the smaller one. So I've got my gloves on just in case I fall over. All the uh, spin effects out here is incredibly sharp. It's, you'll probably go through your hand if you land on it hard enough. So uh, I'll give it a go. Well, I haven't even walked more than 100 meters from my car, and already I found something interesting. I've got part of this old bottle here. It looks like an old cordial type bottle. And uh, a lot of old bottles happen to have the uh, year of manufacture on the bottom. And this one says 1955. So it's been sitting out here in the desert for, for what, nearly 60 something years. It's, uh, yeah, pretty impressive. Just goes to show that you know things out in the desert don't break down. We don't have the same type of fire sweep through like we would from where I'm from in Queensland, where a bottle like this would be destroyed pretty easily. Out here, the different clumps of spin effects are so sparse that you don't get a good fire sweep through. So this would just be sitting here again for another hundred years or more. It's interesting though, you know, someone walked past where I'm walking right now having a drink and threw the bottle down. <laughs> I'll keep moving. Going's not too difficult. You just gotta watch your footing. Uh, the rocks just tend to flick out underneath my feet. But slowly, surely, I. Uh, hasn't taken this long. There's my car all the way down there. Here we are. <laughs> it's actually a fairly easy hike. It's just a lot of uphill. Oh. Wow, it's just uh, <laughs> as far as the eye can see, it's just Mali and spin effects. There's <laughs> no sign of civilization other than on the top of that hill, there's a little marker. Otherwise, I think I'm the only person up here. Oh, vastness. You can just imagine the uh, First Nations people coming here to meet. It'd be the most awesome spot. Plenty of wallabies and water, birds, lizards. You can easily find the spot anytime. Absolutely nothingness. Stillness. I'm feeling okay, I've just reached the bottom. I think I'll tackle the second mountain as well. This one all the way up here. I found out what this marker is. It's just a, uh, a mountain marker. I got the, the name of the mountain there, I think. 
There's also a time capsule here. So I'm gonna open that up and take a look inside. Nice list of names and uh, dates of people who have made it to the top of the mountain. Huh. Goes back to 96 by the looks of it. Little notepad up here too for stories. Woods family from Melbourne. This plaque on this pile of rocks tells a pretty important story of the history of this area. It says, Ernest Giles Explorer. This pile of rocks was assembled by the explorer Ernest Giles and Jess Young on the 20th of June, 1875, during Giles' successful fourth expedition to Perth. He first visited Mount Fink on 3rd of April, 1875. Been well over 100 years and here I am standing here now on top of this mount admiring the same view. Would have been insane to travel this country as an explorer and just doing it by a camel or horse. I just don't see how they could have survived to carry enough water across this country. Oh, and the sand, walking in sand day after day would be uh, pretty tiring as well. Huh. Check out this little guy, it's a little bush cockroach, right on top of the mountain. Quite cute. Well, that was definitely worth the effort coming up. If you're ever out this way, be sure to get your boots on and go for a walk up to the top. The track out from uh, Mount Fink Campground comes across this dry lake by the looks of it. The uh, sand is quite impressive, it's very sparkling. Millions of little diamonds sparkling in the sun. The height of the dunes have decreased and the sands have turned iron red. The corrugations on the track out fairly bad. So probably not as bad as Cape York, but uh, certainly give me a good shaking about. Yeah, it sure gets loud in the old landing. I feel a great sense of accomplishment. Another track completed. Another memory created. Well, I've made it out to the Trans-Australian Railway Line. From here on, it's a trip down the Trans Access Road to Vandambo. onwards to explore the Udnadatta track and beyond. <laughs>